New developments in the Rohingya crisis. The U.S. has withdrawn military assistance from Myanmar over that country's treatment of its Rohingya Muslim minority. There are now more than 600,000 refugees who have fled across the border to Bangladesh. Actually, we're going to update that. 900,000 refugees. And the situation in this massive refugee camp is dire. Canada is increasing its aid to help and is sending former Ontario Premier Bob Ray as an envoy to advise the Prime Minister on what more needs to be done to talk more about that. I'm joined by CTV's Peter Ackman, who has just returned from Bangladesh, and he joins us in studio. And uh, also joining us is social activist Fareed Khan, who spearheaded a petition signed by Canadians to push for more help. So, Peter, let me begin with you, because the world's been watching these horrific images of this, what is now the largest refugee camp in the world. You were there. You saw these people and all of these children. Tell me about your thoughts after having done spent some time there. Yeah, well, we were there about a, a week. It was an eye-opening experience just to see the expanse in, uh, of uh, refugee camp. I mean, they just went on and on and on. But it was squeezed within about a 10-square-kilometer area, and it was just house after house. Uh, in that shot that you're looking at, it's just all the aid that keeps pouring in because... For the most part, it's not the Bangladeshi government doing much of anything to support them. In fact, they're keeping them sort of locked away in this ghettoized area. Instead, it's all the aid groups who are trying to figure out logistics of filling boats uh, with, with water to help those who are stuck in a no man's land. And uh, people are living with dirt floors, a lack of sanitation, uh, lack of clean drinking water. It's really a, a dire situation for many of these people. And, and the children are the ones who are suffering the most, uh, many of them with uh, needing to get proper immunizations and shots to, to stay alive, basically, in this very squeezed-together area. And the children, most because there's so many of them, and when you're, when you're in such a dire situation, you spend a lot of time, even with the children, and there's still kids at heart. Well, absolutely. Here's a, a, a video of me. I just, I, I couldn't help myself. They, the smiles, they just... Let's listen in. Five? Five. Six? Seven, ten. Eight, 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 nine, nine, nine ten. ten. Yay! Wow. And, and I know from, because we, we chat a little bit off camera about your trip, you were teaching them little games to play and hopscotch and whatnot. At the end of the day, it must have been so incredibly heartbreaking. It, it was. And I'm a father and I have kids that are that age, That those kids that we're, we're joking around with there. And these kids... They don't have schools. Uh, UNICEF has set up these sort of safe zone areas where kids can come if they can uh, to them and do some drawing. But really, it turns into almost some uh, trying to help them mentally mm -hmm. adjust to the, the, the atrocities that they've seen. In fact, they've asked them to draw pictures of what they remember, what they think of at night, what they dream of. And many of them are drawing pictures of people hanging from trees, military shooting at them, uh, mil uh, helicopter gunships firing on their villages, their homes being burnt down. And these are just pictures that these children are, aren't being encouraged to, to draw this violence. It's what they've seen. And so they're echoing that back in their artwork. Haunting images. And Fareed, uh, Khan, let me bring you in on this because you've been following these events very closely, heartbroken yourself to see what's going on. So that motivated you to get a, a number of signatures on a petition. Since then, there have been developments. We mentioned Bob Ray, now the envoy. Is that a step in the right direction? I have uh, the greatest of respect for Bob Ray. I think he's a, he's a great statesman. However, I don't know what Bob Ray is going to be able to do that others haven't tried to do. The uh, ambassador to the Canadian ambassador to Myanmar um, had requested uh, access to the areas that were affected, and she only got limited access with very strict control by the military. Uh, we've got uh, aid agencies and uh, human rights groups that have been reporting not just from Bangladesh, but uh, from Myanmar before they were restricted from entering Rakhine State, which is where 
the uh, Rohingya originate from. Um, so there, the data and information is out there. So I don't know what Bob Ray is going to be able to accomplish that others haven't been able to. In addition, uh, the Prime Minister has direct access to the leader of Myanmar, Aung San Suu Kyi. He's spoken to her. He has uh, written a letter to her. And uh, we still haven't had any response back to uh, to uh, to those uh, uh, to those uh, activities. So um, I, I wish Mr. Ray luck in what he's doing. I mean, he's he's uh, working on an issue that has now galvanized the world. But I don't know that he's going to be able to accomplish anything more than what's already being accomplished. And and Peter, from the the folks that are there, that are in you know the women, the children, and 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 the men also from in that refugee camp. Ultimately, their hope would be that they want to get out of the situation. Do they feel like they're getting international? Do they understand that there's attention, though they need so much more? Well, initially, there was a lot of attention. The media all swarmed around that area when they first started coming out. Uh, but when we were there, uh, there were really no media outlets left. Some local media were doing some reporting. Uh, but it really, as news happens, it it moves away. And so aid groups, many of them were saying to me, they, they've they seen a sharp decrease in the funds that they've seen coming in because of a lack of attention. And even, you know, people reading the news, they don't see it top of the top of the page and so it, it, it falls away. And so many of the people there are very frustrated because they, even if they're allowed to go back, mm -hmm. what are they going back to? Their homes have been burned, their villages destroyed, and then the threat of being killed again. And this, these types of atrocities haven't just been going on since August. Uh, these, these have been going on for decades. And so how do you return a people back there? But these people who are all squatted together, stuck together in these refugee camps, they're, well, many of them are farmers. They want land. Mm -hmm. They want to uh, provide for their families, for their, for their children, for their villages, and not be waiting for a handout from UNICEF or some, some group to help them you know, feed their families. Let me ask you this, Fareed, because we heard you know, the United Nations has called this a textbook case of ethnic cleansing. The United States may, in fact, make that declaration. Rex Tillerson may make that declaration, we're hearing, in the United States, which would clear the way for more funding when they, they hope that that would be the case if, in fact, that declaration is made. Where is a step in the right direction, then, um, on, a, on, let's say, even a multilateral approach? Okay, well, with respect to the U.S., uh, actually, the ambassador, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., has already called it ethnic cleansing. So I think the United States is already there, but I guess they need their secretary of state to make some sort of yeah. official official designation. But in terms of a multilateral approach, um, what uh, what the petition that I sponsored was asking for was for Canada to lead a multilateral approach as a, as a nation that is uh, seen on the world stage with respect, uh, our voice would carry weight and to work with our partners and our allies to uh, not only address uh, the humanitarian crisis which is happening in uh, Bangladesh, but also use the United Nations protocol called Responsibility to Protect, which uh, Canada was a signatory to and sponsored after what happened to the Kosovars at the end of the Balkans war and that, that would mean that forces would UN forces would go into uh, Myanmar and carve out a space a protected space for the Rohingya put themselves between the Rohingya and the um, and the uh, the uh, Myanmar forces which are doing the killing and the destruction and also worth noting, Farid, that this isn't something that just started in August because of the fighting that began there. This has been um, repression and suppression that's been going on for years. It has been, and there are historical roots uh, to this, which go back to World War II, uh, because during World War II, the British asked the Rohingya to fight with them against the Japanese, and in return, they promised the Rohingya that they would get their own state. Um, so the Rohingya fought for the British. The uh, the uh, Bimar majority, which are primarily Buddhists, they actually fought on the side of the Japanese. However, after World War II, when um, uh, the Rohingya were expecting a new state that they 
could call home, the British reneged on that promise. And so that is uh, the uh, source of the modern-day historical animosity between the Rohingya and the majority Burman um, uh, ethnic group in, uh, in Myanmar. Uh, in addition, over the years since World War II, there has been uh, increased repression, and especially after the military coup in the early 60s, which uh, um, where the military took over Myanmar and ran it up until the most recent time period when Aung San Suu Kyi became um, De facto. Uh, the leader of, mm -hmm. of, uh, of Myanmar. So this has been going on for decades, but each decade the repression has been stepped up and now it has been, it's the worst ever. And let me give a final word to you, Peter. Um, after having done those stories there, um, what, was your, what was your overriding thought and the messaging that, that you wanted people to know and the stories that you told through your stories that we ran? Well, I think that just for for most people who see the story, they're shocked because they had no idea. And as the, the cycle progresses and the Rohingya come up in the news and down in the news, don't forget there are nearly a million people sitting there. And many of them didn't just arrive since August. Many of them have been in these camps for 15 years, for 20 years. These are refugee camps, they call them refugee camps, but when do they stop being camps and start being the place where they're stuck? Forever. Mm -hmm. And so the world needs to remember because the history continues to happen again and again. These people are being uh, murdered in their home country. There's no protection for them there. They're running to Bangladesh, which has opened its borders, but what that means in the long term for these for these people, for these children, is a life in camps, a life in of hunger and starvation and disease, and and it can't be forgotten. Glad that you were able to come and talk about it and your trip and free con. Thank you also to you for joining us once again. Appreciate it. Thank you, Beverly. We'll be right back.